Well, good evening, everybody. Oh, Toledo, how are you tonight? Okay. I am so happy to see you here for this event, um, Brian Kennedy's farewell address, uh, celebrating his time here at the Toledo Museum of Art. Thank you for joining us. I'm Scott Boberg, Manager of Programs, and it's my great pleasure to welcome people to the Paris style. So thank you for being in this amazing, amazing space and at the museum. Um, just a couple of quick notices. I like to say that my phone is out so I can turn off the noise-making properties. Encourage you to do the same with your smartphone. If you wouldn't mind, if you are going to take a still photo, just please turn off the flash. You're welcome to take videos as well. After the Brian's main presentation, we'll be bringing, as we often do for events, uh, microphones out into either hallway. So if you have a question or comment for Brian at the end, as time allows, just make your way to either aisle and we'll just form a lineup on either side and alternate back and forth and try to get everybody in with your questions and comments. Uh, at the very end, we encourage everyone to join us up in Libby Court for a toast afterwards. So stick around for that as well. It is now my great honor and pleasure to welcome to the stage Cynthia Thompson, Chair of the Board of Directors of the Toledo Museum of Art. Thank you. Brian Patrick Kennedy is our ninth director and CEO, and our first Edward Drummond and Florence Scott Libby director. We have had a fantastic, wonderful nine years working with Brian on his fabulous accomplishments. He is a scholar, a gentleman, and my friend. And you will hear more from him because this moment, this time right now, it's all about Brian. Please join me in welcoming Brian Kennedy to the stage. Well, good evening to you all, and thanks for coming in on a lovely evening, lovely Friday evening in Toledo. Um, I wanted to end my time uh, here on the stage of the Peristyle for very particular reasons. Um, I think very carefully about my first day on the job. And my first day here, early in the morning, I had asked that all the staff be on the stage. And many of the staff had never been on the stage before. So they were all sitting here, looking out this way. And quite a few people perhaps here present. And I was doing the sort of Stefan Sanderling here, you know. <laughs> I was a conductor. But the point was obvious to everybody. On the one hand, you could have said, we need to do more with the peristyle. But more obviously, our job is to fill seats. Our job is to engage the visitors. And so for me to end my time here uh, with you in the peristyle um, is a celebration of the fact that when I came to my second interview here, um, I realized that we could get to play with the peristyle as well. And every single person I've ever brought in here, and everybody who works in the peristyle knows how true this is, comes in, if they have no idea what it is, and they just say, wow. And this is the most stunning space in any American museum, I think. So that's why we're here. I want to take you quickly through uh, my nine years, but as a sort of strategic effort. So you see that the symmetry that I've referred to is very much part of what I do. What I try to do in museums and what I'm invited to do by boards is to come in and strategize a future and help to envision a future and make a plan. I believe in having a plan. And at the beginning, we started to ask questions. The questions were, how could we be more sustainable for the future? And how could we about, be about the basic message of this institution, which is art education? So we asked lots of questions like, what are your favorite memories of Toledo Museum of Art? What do you love most about it? We tried all sorts of methods to engage questions. We ended up with 3,200 questions. 
that people are asking, why don't you fix the faucet at the bottom of these stairs? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? We had a wonderful exercise where we joined with five other museums, and we had eight members of staff from each museum, and we sent the staff members to each museum as part of what was called the Innovatrium, which was to develop an innovation community. So we come up with lots of ideas about how we could not only help the museum, uh, but help Toledo. And I hope that that's worked. I think it has. And there's lots more to do, there always is. But we came up with these principles, and these principles guided everything that we were doing, that everything must involve art, you know, even weddings, that everything was about people, that it was people make things happen in an art museum, and that the basic mission of Toledo Museum of Art, established in 1901, which is read by the board at every December meeting, Cynthia's been reading it for the last three years, is that we should integrate art into people's lives. Always seeking to add value means, for example, don't give a talk without recording it. Don't have an event without taking photographs. And of course, we were entering into the age of social media. And particularly, you had to plan and then activate, implement, but you also had to evaluate to work out what was good and what was and what needed to be done more. And then never ask anybody for money unless you've got a good idea. And so we had to have lots of ideas, and we worked very hard at that. And then we came up with a plan, and the plan had these five aims. One was to give more access to the collection. Then was to teach visual literacy, which at the beginning, people weren't really sure what that was. Um, don't we do that already? Well, how do we teach people to truly understand what they see? How do we become more visible? How do we help the country and internationally people to know that the Toledo Museum of Art is truly extraordinary? And how do we develop all the assets of this museum and especially, how do we work with the creative practitioners who make art? So a lot of the living artists who come here have been driven out of that policy. And we started to drive together with other organizations. And an organization called Toledo Area Cultural Leaders had started in 2008, and it had about nine members. And um, Mark Folk and I became uh, co-chairs. He's the head of the Arts Commission, brilliant man, Mark Folk. And today, it's something like 25 organizations meeting monthly and now led by Jason Kushma from the library and Laurie Hauser from Imagination Station. But this was really the way of activating uh, the city's arts organizations, the way the Downtown Development Corporation and then 22nd Century Committee and now Connect Toledo uh, gathered together the leaders of many different organizations, uh, for profit and not for profit in the city, which has been so beneficial. We started to do lots of new things. You know, innovation is like try it. And if it fails, just do it different. And so we, we rebadged uh, the December activities between the day after Christmas and the new year as the great art escape. And it's grown and grown and grown and become very, very lively. We examined our visiting hours and we decided we'll open late on a Thursday as well as on a Friday. We'd not done that before. We decided that we would activate the peristyle in different ways. And Scott Boberg, who introduced Cynthia, has done an amazing job. But one of them is the silent movies that many of you have enjoyed here with organ music. What sorts of things could be connected to the visual that would activate the peristyle and activate the gardens? So we, we used to do twilight tours or flashlight tours in the museum. We started to do a lot more of those. Then we did flashlight tours out in the gardens. And people loved those too. And then when we were out in the gardens, we said, why not project movies on the side of the glass pavilion and on the sides of the buildings? And all of these activities were early starts, early innovations, um, you know, easy wins, if you like that helped to condition uh, other experiences. Another thing was to take time and space. So we started to do time-based work, and th this involved working considerably with the Toledo Symphony. One of the early um, aspects of this was the 24-hour Bach around the clock. Um, we were certainly at the Glass Pavilion at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, I think only eight people were there at 6 o'clock the next morning. Um, but in all told, it involved about 2,200 people. And then there were collections in the Toledo Museum of Art that hadn't been given a lot of attention. They'd had a sporadic attention. But we have one of the world's great collections outside of Japan of Netsuke, the only other uh, collection in America that's like ours in quality is in Los Angeles. So this was truly special to make a Netsuke room. It, it was extraordinary to me when I came here that you couldn't get into the peristyle when the museum was open. And we had to work out how to do that. In winter 2012, we opened the peristyle during the day so you could walk in and take pictures of it. That was an early innovation. A later one was uh, we came up with this idea of Monroga. And so we've had yoga 
on the peristyle stage, we've had yoga in the great gallery, and we've particularly had yoga out on the forecourt. Um, it's a easier just at the moment because the Calder's off being painted. And then we started to introduce playgrounds, playgrounds around the, the museum. And this is a prelude to what this museum space will become in the next 15, 20 years. I'm absolutely confident of that. And the most recent of these innovations, some of you have been at, and I know will grow over the years as we learn to improve it, improve it, improve it, but it's the Nat Geo Live, National Geographic uh, films. And the three this year are terrific, and next year will really attune to what you really like to go to. And I'm sure this theater will fill and it will become a subscription series. One of the things that was most important to the board was how would we become more inclusive? How would we get more people who didn't come to the museum to start coming to the museum? And in an art museum, the best way to do that, of course, is to do it with the collection first. So if you make the collection more inclusive and diverse, then people will recognize themselves in the collection. For example, we had a Jack Yates painting, the brother of W.B. Yates. It hadn't been on show for decades. It was actually bought by the museum two years after Jack Yates painted it, and we put it out. I guarantee you, everybody like me of Irish background registered with that one painting. And so you multiply that by lots of different aspects, and you create inclusivity. We took a map of the world in 2012, and we stuck pins in all the countries where we didn't have anything from there. We were missing whole continents. I'd spent eight years in Australia as director of the National Gallery. We didn't do Oceania. There's a lot of interesting work going on there. And so we started to broaden out our collections. And more recently, you know, it's extended, of course, through the exhibitions and through the programs, diversifying our staff, our board, our volunteers. And I'm delighted uh, that we managed to publish a companion. The last one we had was a real doorstop. You know, it's wonderful. The handbook that many of you have. I mean, you could put it on the door, and the door will not open, you know, it will not shut, right? And this is one that you can actually walk around with, uh, and it has a lot of information about what we've been trying to do, and it came out uh, towards the end of the year. And I'd encourage you to, if you're going to bring a bottle of wine to, a, um, to a, a party or whatever you bring, you could also bring a companion to the museum. Think about that. Same price. But we, we, bought, we bought a lot of works of art. Um, the most expensive uh, was something that was offered to me by Larry Nichols before I ever became director, which was a bit of a shock, um, but we bought it. And this was the Franz Hals painting, um, which is totally magnificent, uh, the Van Kampen family, as we found out later, uh, in a landscape. And we bought so many different works, When we got gifts of works as well. Um, Pat McLaughlin and Edith Franklin gave us these. These were extraordinary. These were the earliest glass objects made in the first glass workshops in 1962. This is what it looked like at the beginning. Look at our glass in the museum store now. It quickly became something from this because these were glass made in a mobile furnace and that's what the workshops help people to do. We put Spiegel, an identical um, mirror group of figures made from the letters of multiple languages down at the Monroe-Collingwood border. So we'd extend the campus down there Quickly, we had people being married in them. We had lots of photographs. And people do things the way they want to. They make things their own. And fortunately, and you know, I hope it continues, we've had no damage to works of art out on the campus. And I know why. Because it's the neighborhood garden for people around here. They're their works of art. And we need to keep that going into the future. We bought works by Frank Stella that I'd worked with, and we brought him here and on the stage. We packed the peristyle, and he started making chalk marks on a chalkboard. And you know, one day I noticed that it was actually being thrown out at the back of the museum. And I said, oh my god, that's Frank Stella's chalkboard. OK, it was one of those moments. We pulled it back inside, so we rescued it. Um, yeah, it happens. And um, this was Ukbar by Sean Scully, who also came here and gave a talk. I was thrilled recently um, we, that we continued the work we've been doing, buying works by women artists, when we got this magnificent work by Elizabeth Murray um, called Stay Awake, which um, uh, I was just in the exhibition, and it has the most wonderful music. If you want to stay awake, put the music on that's beside this work. It'll get you, go it'll get you bopping, I guarantee you. Um, but also Alison Saar, um, who will be coming here in the fall. She's going to do it. We're going to have a little exhibition of Alison Saar in the program. The future program is great that Halona has put together with the team, and you're going to enjoy it over the next couple of years. Um, we bought a lot of material related to birds, and Paula Reich did four exhibitions on birds to coincide with the biggest week in American birding. That's going to continue because the birds aren't going anywhere, and neither is the museum. 
And so we bought a wonderful series of volumes of books, um, the earliest uh, book from France of birds the other day, which was the first time that 250 species that were unknown had ever been published. So we're adding to that. We extended our Asian collections. We bought Japanese suits of armor. Um, we, we were looking throughout the entire world. We wanted every room to have a chandelier that was appropriate to the art in that room. So we bought this extraordinary work um, owned by the brother of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, the, there was one more of these, but it was destroyed during the Second World War, so totally unique. Um, only three of these are known, and this had been uh, taken from, by missionaries from the Torres Strait Islands, or islands which are up at the northeast coast, off the northeast coast of Australia. And this is an extraordinary mask uh, made from human hair and ivory. We put Paula in front of the museum with the most extraordinary 400 foot long crane that brought pieces of it and dropped it just in front of the building. And of course, the Plensa show that was all over the campus was wonderful, but um, donors came forward to say this should not move. And Paula became part of Toledo Museum of Art. And she is beautiful. We extended ele electronic arts. We, haven't, we hadn't much at all. And that's about half of the production of artists today is in digital arts. Um, but for example, David Hockney's Wallgate Woods and a whole series of others extended our role. We bought works with the Georgia Wells Apollo Society, and Georgia's here, welcome Georgia. Um, the Apollo Society now, after 33 years, um, acquiring works of art that have extended our collection, works of Native American art, works in glass, works of ancient art, works that extended the range into Africa, into fairy painting, uh, back into European art, and again into ancient art. Contemporary art, Mary Sabande from South Africa, Native American art, Ravinder Reddy from India, and Yinka Shanabare, African but living in England, and Maya Lin's extraordinary droplets, and the Flavian woman here with her very noteworthy hairstyle. And then the other day, last Sunday, we acquired this extraordinary work, which is 11 feet long and taller than me, and he's sitting down, by Viola Fry. Extraordinary work that will fast become a fan favorite when you see it very soon. So the Georgia Wells Apollo Society has been a great driver of our acquisitions. But our exhibitions have been of different kinds. Um, just before I get to those, when I arrived here, we'd never given anything back to a source country. And this was problematic because we had quite a number of works that um, we had no provenance for them. We really didn't know where they'd come from. And so this was the first time that we gave a work back which was this wonderful sweetmeat dish given back to Dresden. But uh, we've given works back pretty well every year since, and a lot of great museums like ours will do that because in the decades past, um, we really were doing what was the orthodoxy then. We thought that by acquiring them, no matter where they came from, because we published them straight away and conserved them and made them available to the public on display, uh, we were doing the right thing. But of course, if they had been removed illegally or without a, an export license, it wasn't the right thing. In terms of exhibitions, they've been of lots of different types. More traditional ones, uh, like Manet uh, portraits, which you all remember, done with an exhibition called Made in Hollywood, and also with multiple portraits of members of the Toledo community that took over the whole of Gallery One, if you remember that. But also in that manner, the Tuileries Gardens exhibition, uh, which was very beautiful, and Claude Fixler has done masterwork at uh, designing one show after the other, and now uh, Car Culture uh, just opening this weekend. The house is subject to an exhibition that has been in Toledo and then in Brussels and Larry Nichols recently at the opening in Paris as it has been put together with the other known parts of this large painting which we thought we were buying two thirds of a painting and now we know we were buying half of a painting. But uh, it was a very important half uh, as you can see. We wanted to extend into Asia but by recovering works from our collection we have the most superlative collection of Japanese prints of the early 20th century outside of Japan. And you remember Carolyn Putney's beautiful exhibition, Fresh Impressions. We extended into indigenous art. And we acquired this wonderful exhibition, Crossing Cultures, which I think really blew people away. It was so beautiful, um, of Australian Aboriginal art. And that then allowed us to have a major exhibition of the Diker Collection, Indigenous Beauty. And that allowed us then to acquire works of Aboriginal art from Australia and works of indigenous art from America and to build out on our colonial collections with native collections. 
There were many more popular exhibitions, which you know, in the past we wouldn't have thought to do, but they were about design, the history of design, for example, the art of video games, that was about the design of video games. We then explored the concept of play and creative time and creative play in playtime, which was the most successful exhibition of my time. We had 135,000 visitors, and we had some of the most extraordinary events. A, a, a grand piano with a lady on it swinging around in the forecourt, yeah. And the swing time and this extraordinary work that was in Canada where you could climb into it. But the most extraordinary thing involved a red ball. And the red ball went running around uh, Toledo. It was the most colorful thing to happen in Toledo since the green water. But, uh, it, was, but it was better, but it was much better. Um, and it was a viral sensation when it blew down the street and had three million people looking at it on Facebook. So it really got us in the news. And similar vein, uh, sneaker culture did that. Kehinde Wiley came here and he filled the peristyle and his exhibition was extraordinary. And just at the time of the, the last election, uh, we held an exhibition uh, curated by Harriet Balkin and Adam Levine called I Approve This Message, which decoded political ads on visual literacy principles. And I think it was a very major show. We had smaller shows to mark the history of our region, the Battle of Lake Erie, for example, and um, are focusing on aspects of our collection the mummies brought to Toledo by the Libbies in 1906. Um, we explored the work of artists, living artists, and we brought the irregular polygons of Frank Stella to Toledo. But we were, because he'd just become a grandfather, and now that I have last May, I understand what he was saying. He said, I'd have never let you do this, Brian, but I've just become a grandfather. We put a playground, essentially, in the middle of the shelf. You could make your own irregular polygons. And that was a breakthrough for us, because you can see that for so many exhibitions now, we have a built-in area for play. And in that vein, Small Worlds was an extraordinary exhibition of works that were, you know, they were miniature um, aspects by artists, but big works that Amy Gilman curated. Larry Nichols worked with the Toledo Ballet to have a rehearsal studio in the Degan, the dance show, for the Nutcracker. And then he was Mother Ginger in the Nutcracker, which was great. Um, Larry certainly can gesticulate. Um, and then we did something that if you asked me a few years before, we would never have done, which was we put Gabriel Dawes' incredible plexus in the middle of the great gallery. And it was beautiful. And again, it was a Facebook sensation, as indeed was more recently the Rebecca Louise Law's incredible 500,000 flowers, which on Facebook um, got more, you know, so many um, likes because people saw themselves in the work and wanted to be photographed there. And that's what we want to happen, that people want to be in our museum and be photographed there. So a museum director has to address art and buildings and people and money. They're the four things. So let's go to buildings. With the buildings, we weren't building a new building, but we had to envisage what would we do with the campus. And we've got incredible buildings, two Pritzker Prize-winning architects buildings on the one campus. Um, but, you know, Mr. Green would have won one as well. You know, we, our building is, of course, modeled on uh, and a larger version of his design in Buffalo. He was an architect from Buffalo. Um, but here, working in Toledo with Harry Wachter, they made an incredible job of original building and then expanding it in the 1930s under Mrs. Libby. Fritz and Mary Wolf um, did an extraordinary thing when I became director. They gave a gift um, of $2 million, and so that went to essentially what was a $3 million renovation of what had been the glass gallery, where we had all the glass before it went across to the glass pavilion. But it was to be made into a, a gallery of contemporary art, and that was hugely important to me because, you know, you need to work with living artists. Great art is made by great artists, and there are great artists alive, and we want to bring them to Toledo. So this was a big, big improvement and the first sort of change in our galleries um, of a sequence that happened later, 6,000 square feet here. And we put more solar panels on the roof so that we had 1,500 solar panels on the roof of the building. And then in May 2013, uh, we went off the grid with 1,500 more that we put in the parking lot. So we had 3,000 solar panels and we won many awards for sustainability um, over the years. After the Wolf Gallery, um, it's the more recent renovation of what had been storage for lights and other um, works, um, and then the renovation of the Levis Galleries, which has allowed me to say that we have restored over 20,000 square feet of gallery within our building um, over the last nine years. And this is the Levis Galleries with the current exhibition, Global Conversation. 
um, conversations where we raised the roof nine feet and we put in this incredible end grain fir floor that will last 100 years. And then in the new media space, um, currently the Everything is Rhythm, Rhythm Music show, we had a, a more enclosed space without the natural light on the, on the top, but that, which can be flexible. And each of these two areas can be combined together to make an extraordinary temporary exhibition space in the future for any size exhibition you want. And then we acquired 64 apartments on Museum Place to preserve the apartments uh, for, the, for the public and to protect uh, the museum environment. Um, they're not cash positive yet, but they're not costing us too much. And we're going to work with developers in the future, and that'll be for a next generation of, of museum leader here, um, to work out. But the board is absolutely committed to um, maintaining and then developing uh, this space. The mayor of Toledo last year helped us to launch uh, the camp museum campus plan. And this was an expensive but wonderful exercise by the museum to envisage why we would stop putting things around the campus without knowing what we wanted to do with the entire campus in the future. And this will certainly change the museum moving forward. Um, this is the, these are the two uh, entrances that will be either side of the main steps with an alley of trees and a, a door cut at the ground floor level um, into the side of the, of the stone, either side of the main steps. And you will enter the museum from the ground into a large museum store area here and the director's office and the current museum store will be stairs and elevators that will take you up in front of the Libby Court. And the director's office will go to the back of the building with all the other staff. And it's envisioned that we would cut a huge hole in this floor of the Canada Gallery and have a double height space with, with, space with a mezzanine. That's what you're looking at here. Really exciting. Today I received from John Stanley, our, who's going to be our interim director, six hours before I stop, the 100% campus master plan from Bayer Blinder Bell. It's done. It's finished. And it has my name in it. Forget that. But it's important. <laughs> this is what it could look like. This is just a vision. But the vision encapsulates what Bill Beschenstein said to me in my first year here. He said, Brian, why don't you move the road? I said, what? He said, no, why don't you move the road? So this envisaged that Monroe Street, and we bought up the land, could go on the site of the current solar canopy parking lot and swing round echoing the freeway, and then we would get this huge parkland space that would connect the glass pavilion and become a forum for activities, just as four times this summer we will close down the road uh, for car shows. But imagine the possibility of lots of different things happening at all times on that space, and making a neighborhood park and adding to the green space for Toledo. This is kind of an end game. It doesn't have to be this. The road could be calmed, uh, it, lots of just possibilities could take place. It mightn't happen at all, um, but it offers a, a thinking plan for what the future could be for Toledo Museum of Art, just as Prometica and the Metro Parks and Frank Cass and others are doing in other areas of Toledo. We took on visual literacy, I'd call it learning to look at Dartmouth, and visual literacy is quite simply the ability to, um, to read, understand, and write visual language. It's a big idea, but it's not an impossible idea. In the world that is entirely visual today and where things are communicated that way immediately in soundbite vis visual statements and soundbite words made into visual statements, you have to ask, why don't we speak visual? So the question is, do you speak visual? And we took that on in firm manner. We expanded the idea of the elements of art and the principles of design. There's only five of one and eight of the other. So this was quite easy for us. But then we extended to the fact that most people didn't know that we actually have four visual languages, but only one of them is universal. So red is red throughout the world, but red means different things in different parts of the world. Red square, the little red book, right? So the idea, symbol, and meaning language, interpretation language, are what was semiotics and hermeneutics, for example, and ideology. These were actually you know, big sciences out in the academic world but we needed to pull them into the museum and pull in those people who understood them. So we developed these programs, teaching, and all of our docents and all of our staff engaged. And this has become literally what we do. And I'm delighted that this week we found out that the International Visual Literacy Association uh, annual meeting will come back to Toledo in 2020. We had it in 2014, but at the University of Toledo. We set up what we now call baby crawl, but baby tours uh, in 2012. People said, what are you talking about babies? Well, of course, we're not just talking about babies. We're talking about their parents, too, and their guardians.
But this is a way to you know, develop um, in the zero to five range when your brain is totally a sponge and you're influenced for the rest of your life, the opportunity to find the museum. And quickly extended those to toddler tours. This is one of my favorite photographs of all my time here. And then to lots of training programs. So we train the entire staff, train the guards, train the board, train all our volunteers, um, train all of our staff, train our docents, train our ambassadors. And you know, I, I, the other day I learned that 90% of our guard force is now trained, and we, tra we turn over our guard force a bit. Um, so it's very, very important that they've all been through the visual literacy training. We organized a website. We organized texture walls. We, or we reorganized uh, the, uh, the family center, which has become such an important part of the museum and is actually exploding in visitation. It's the most visited place in the museum now. And the Visual Literacy website is now integrated into our own website, ToledoMuseum.org. If you haven't been on it, do go on it, because a lot of material there. And then, as I said, we organized the International Visual Literacy Association Conference in 2014. We had Pinnery Sound Pentax Sound Room, 200 sound boxes. If you remember when you went in under it, and it activated and created a symphonic music if you did it with a whole class of kids. And then we started to apply it elsewhere. And Doug Ponster came over from Owens Corning, and we set up the Center of Visual Expertise to apply visual literacy to safety training for hazard recognition. This will go cash positive next year and could be a very major business for Toledo Museum of Art. It's become wonderful since we started to license the material. And uh, this is certainly something that has been taken up by other museums. People are looking, how did you do that? Apply a museum to industry. Excuse me. Talking fast, so I'm drying up. So with the University of Toledo, uh, just last November, we launched a memorandum of understanding, and that's what's led to the Ivy Lake Conference. And Heidi Apple, who leads the Honors College there, and Sharon Gaber, who's the president, really took this up. This is where we're heading. You've got to understand how quickly artificial intelligence and virtual reality is going to take over our world. You know, it's moving very, very quickly with cars, you know, towards independent cars. So you're seeing it in one way. But the, the impact that this is going to have on multi-sensory environments like museums is very, very dramatic. And I look forward to exploring that, obviously, at Peabody Essex, where they're the only museum in the country to have a neuroscientist on staff, right? That's where we're heading, to how does it work. So you, if, if you go to Walmart, you already know you're, you're being eye-checked, you know, as you walk in. And they follow your eye movement all around the store and how long you spend at every object. That's how they know where to put all the objects, right? So store technology will come into museums, and we'll start to connect. And we'll do that because we'll bring people onto our boards who know how that works. And the international appetite for this has been huge, and I've been very fortunate to be invited um, to different countries, and different members of our museums have come, uh, museum board have come with me. Um, Le M. Leuven is the site of the International Visual Literacy Conference this November. It's going to be great in November. Um, we had our own. We'll have it again. But in China, I was invited to Shanghai where they're really interested in progressive education uh, you know, and the arts being integrated in education in China. And then in France, I've been twice to a major uh, gathering of neuroscientists, some of the best brain scientists in the world, but also other brilliant people. This is Paul Andreu in the white t-shirt here, one of the great, the, well, the greatest airport designer of the last 50 years. He's starting with Charles de Gaulle and on and on it goes. So these, it was incredible to be in these groups it is Stan DeHen, who won the European Brain Prize, um, written wonderful books. Um, this was uh, at Dubai. And uh, this is the director, Victoria Albert, beside me, um, uh, the editor of the Art International Art Newspaper. But at this podium here is this lady, Andrea Zavaraku. And the following day, she won the Global Teacher Prize of the Global Education and Skills Forum that I was at. It takes place in Dubai. And she received a million dollars. And she's used that to set up a foundation. Look her up, Andrea Zavaraku. And she was the first art teacher to win the Global Teacher Prize. And she was on the panel I was on, and then she won. They bring 10 people over from all around the world. And this is exciting, because what somebody like, like Andrea is doing, she's in a school of 35 languages. A huge challenge in, in London. We worked with artists. I love working with artists, but we have great artists. We, have, we had Jeff Mack leading the Glass Studio, and now we've got Alan Iwamura doing an amazing job. 
We brought artists here, a great friend of mine, Varjan Bagosian. Some of you fell in love with him. I think he got a number of marriage proposals while he was here. But Varjan was amazing, and we set up this room where you could make your own shadow box Varjan Bagosian. Artists from Toledo. Leslie Adams had her own exhibition here, and then this year she wins the Governor's Award in Columbus and did a magnificent job. We need to connect with artists, and Trombone Shorty came twice, but the second time he just got off the stage and the whole band walked around the peristyle. Do you remember that evening? It was electric, it was fantastic, and we were getting back, jazz back into the, into the peristyle. Remember, this peristyle had classical music all the way until 1956, and the first non-classical musician to perform here was Duke Ellington, 1956. Fundraising. Um, you know, the first four years with Susan Palmer and the team was getting it all conditioned and establishing the notion that we would think like a founder. We put together a team of incredible people, Cynthia Thompson, Deke Wells, Georgia Wells, Betsy Brady, Jim Hoffman, Sarah Jane DeHoff. They were going to think like a founder. And we, you know, I had mentioned this term in a, I just used it in a, in a Blade article, and I realized that's what we had to call it, polishing the gem. We were going to polish the gem. And it took off. And aside from the $4 million we raise every year, um, we raise $46 million during this four years. If you look at this, you know, anything about fundraising, what's fun here is that you get palpitations three times in four years. It comes to a stop for three months, and you wonder, is it done? And then it starts again. Do you see that step approach? And so this was big work, big work indeed for our development staff with the board, and, but exciting work to help to write the capital campaign offering to the endowment and to restore the endowment that had dropped so dramatically in the Great Recession. We've worked with so many sponsors, lead sponsors like Chromatic and Taylor Cadillac, but all these names here supporting the museum, and then the people associated with those companies getting involved. And it's people make the museum happen. We've had nine male directors. Yes, they've all been men. And they've been great. And they've been remarkable. And they've all brought different aspects to this museum. And now we search out our 10th. And this 10th director will also be the Libby director. And we've had board chairs all the way since 1901, starting with Edward Drum and Libby, but ending with all these people still with us, Richard Anderson, Dick Anderson, Jim, George, Betsy, David, Deke, and Cynthia, and Pat Stranahan, and all these other wonderful people, Sam, Betsy's father, David Wells, George's husband, Deke's father. The legacy aspect of this museum, of people minding it for generations, is extraordinary. And it's been wonderful uh, to work with my board chairs. Women have made this museum happen. Extraordinary women. Women like Florence Scott Libby, like Nina Stevens, unpaid assistant director to George Stevens for years. And others there, Emily Bippus's name is now on the director of education post. Carolyn Putney, Rita Kern, wonderful lady. Amy Gilman, most recently, Posey Hubner. My three board chairs. Betsy, who appointed me, Love you, Betsy. Deke, love him too. Most strategic person. Betsy, the most enthusiastic person I've ever met in my life. The most committed person in terms of dedication to hours to the museum, Cynthia Thompson, who introduced me. It requires extraordinary commitment to decide to accept the offer of board chair of this museum. And I've been so lucky. I've been lucky in so many ways with people. Never more so than with Connie Kutz. From day one to my last day, um, Connie Kutz was the real director of this museum. Uh, where's Connie? <laughs> there she is. And at work and at home, I've been really, really lucky. I've been just extraordinarily lucky to have Mary's support. And I would never have imagined that Mary would start working at the museum and help out with polishing the gem, and she did an amazing job. We introduced so many aspects of getting people involved. The Teen Apprentice Program, it's ongoing uh, throughout the summer. Lots of different programs, some you knew about, some you didn't. A five-month program that we did with Syrian refugees, for example. 
which made a huge difference in their lives. And now uh, some of these women are getting very involved with the museum. We're a Blue Star Museum. We wanted to get involved with veterans. So aspects like the Veteran Glass Blowing Day. Inviting members of the public to come in and tell their own stories. And Scott's been brilliant with this, with local eyes, but here with Hear Me Out. And the Board of Directors, as I said, is an extraordinary group of people. It changes, of course, because people have term limits. But we've had incredible people over my time. And they make a difference in everything that they do by giving me an incredible performance review where I really watch for how I need to improve. I don't care how well I'm doing. I want to know what else can I do. The ambassadors who do an, such an extraordinary job for the museum. The docents who do an amazing job for the museum. And our staff. And I pick out these three gentlemen because they're their groundkeepers. And no matter how many acres I added to the museum, they kept cutting the grass. <laughs> and they are a metaphor for the entire staff of this museum, which is extraordinary in terms of its commitment to making this place great. I've had such a lot of fun. Um, you know, a lot of us, Judith Judy Weinberg, she just kept dressing me up. Um, just a few examples. Yeah. <laughs> These are the ones that I don't want you to show. I'm gonna... Yeah, we had a lot of dress up. That was Alice in Wonderland for Small World. And the glass show, where the, oh look at Tom Brady there. Where they got me looking so ridiculous, but I gave it my all. The ambassadors loved it. Yeah. It was fun. It's been fun. We've had such a lot of good times. Um, I mentioned Larry having the opportunity, but I gotta tell you, for a sheer adrenaline rush, there is nothing better than being Mother Ginger. <laughs> Working with the community has been the essence of what we've been doing. Um, when we had the Glass Art Society Conference, the 50th anniversary, that was a big deal. 1,500 people coming to Toledo. Many of those artists have passed away. It really was the time, 50 years on from 1962, of the last hurrah, and it was extraordinary. All the different events that we've worked with the Toledo Symphony Orchestra, with the Toledo Youth Orchestra, and the way that music is being integrated ever more into the museum. I've mentioned the teens, but the teens are taken over. They have their own events. This is your night that takes place uh, in the museum, in the great gallery. Our, our young people's group circle, uh, which certainly enjoyed the Tur Kentucky Derby. Um, when we had Kende Wiley, again, you know, you have palpitations, but you get over it. Um, and this was what happened there. Yeah, we had hundreds of young people break dancing in the the great gallery. And the reason we were able to do that was and liberate the museum through the Kehinde Wiley show was because of this event, which was undoubtedly my favorite event, but definitely a once in a century event of all my time. Yes, we'll pick, we'll have this one. When we had 1,600 Girl Scouts sleeping overnight in the museum. <laughs> that was a lot of pizza. And it was great. And you know, people will have memories of sleeping under the roof and sleeping under the Rembrandt or whatever for the rest of their lives. And we put an historical marker out on the campus. We've now got two markers, one for the museum and the other for the fact that Mrs. Libby and Nina Stevens and others established the first chartered um, troop of Girl Scouts in America here in Toledo, Ohio. Founded in Savannah, Georgia, first troop here in Toledo, Ohio. And that's why we had this, it was great. And the block party has become an expression of our involvement with the Old West End Festival and with the neighborhood, Englewood behind, Old West End in front. And people last year walking to the party. We had 10,000 people last year. So on the 13th of July, uh, if we continue to have our good luck, we've had five beautiful days in a row uh, on, the, on the block party. If we get a sixth, I think we'll have a very big crowd indeed. And you know, we've won a lot of awards. And I always say your reputation is what other people say about you. And people have said good things about us. Uh, the readers of Ohio Magazine made us best art museum. In 2016 also, we had our record visitation here, which was 457,000 visitors. We are the second most visited art museum in the country per capita of population after the National Gallery. And that is amazing. <laughs> the Ohio Museum Association named us Institution of the Year. This is a big state. There are 12, 13 million people in this state. That's the bigger than a lot of countries. Our supporters won awards, Georgia Wells that year, um, Sarah Jane DeHoff, Cynthia Thompson, and others. Um, Georgia is truly remarkable, as are all the great people who support this museum. We won so many awards. We won a gold award for the publication that we made for our glass pavilion 
and we won the award for our annual report and we work hard at these things um, but you know being named by USA, USA Today readers as the top Ohio attraction was also important and so I hope that this is recognition of our staff but nothing made me more happy than the fact that visitors here can walk out and they can give feedback on the museum during my time and for every year of my time we've been number one on TripAdvisor we are the number one thing to do on TripAdvisor in this city. That is five out of five certificate of excellence. We have more high approval ratings than any other institution in the city. Now, we have great institutions, but that's what we really want to work at. So um, I end by concluding with a thank you to every one of you here for taking your Friday evening to come to hear this and celebrate what you all did together, what you all experienced together, and to ask you to continue to experience great things here at this great museum. And I, so I, I end, uh, and maybe if you have a few questions, that'll be fine. I think we might have a few minutes left, but by offering you my thanks. Um, deepest thanks for the honor of being director of your museum, uh, for all that you have taught me, and all that I've learned personally and professionally, and all that will take into my future life. Thank you, Toledo Museum of Art supporters. Thank you. <laughs> and to you, I salute you. Keep minding this great museum into the future. It really deserves it. All right. Okay, has anybody got a question or anything they want to ask me? I mean, I think we fixed, we fixed most things, but there are probably other things to be fixed. But ask that to the next person, will you? Um, anybody got a question? Everybody happy? If everybody's happy, you just want to go and have a drink, don't you? Yeah, now we're talking. Will we all agree to do that? Anybody want to say something? Oh, you do. Okay. John, do you want to move over? Can you just talk about the next steps? Where I'm going next? Yeah. Steps. <laughs> um, what's my plans? Look, I, I, I will explain this to you. Um, you know, some people stay a long time in places, and some people do a certain kind of job. And you know the kind of job I've done, because that's the kind of job I do, right? In the different places. And then you set up a plan, and then somebody else has got to deliver the plan. But something happened last year, I, I mentioned it. I became a grandfather in May. And uh, you know that's not a gift that comes to everybody, and certainly not a gift I expected, but it really gave me a bit of a land. You know? My god, I'm a grandfather. It was a sort of recognition that I'd reached a certain stage in life. You know? I'd not just have a child, I'd have a grandchild. And uh, anyway, that had happened. And it was there in the background. And then we finished the Polishing the Gem campaign in June last, and then we launched a new strategic plan for four years in July 1 last. And then we were having the campus master plan to be completed this June. And then I was approached about this job in Peabody Essex, and I gotta tell you, I know now my name was on it. Because what this museum wants to do what this museum has just done. Um, it wants to be much more multi-sensory, it wants to engage art education, it wants to use incredible resources. Um, it's very fortunate. It's, it's the museum that has had the, large, uh, the most quickest development of any art museum in America in the last 25 years. It's had one director since 1992. I've never succeeded somebody who's retiring. Um, Dan Monroe is 74. He's not retiring. He's just leaving Peabody Essex. Um, I've never started on kind of the day after the other chap leaves. I've always had the six months in you know, the gap that will happen here. Um, but uh, they're very ambitious, and um, they've grown this museum from a $3 million budget to a $34 million budget since 1992. And they've grown their endowment from $30 million to $500 million since 1992. They've got incredible people involved, and there's a lot of museums over near Boston. Um, but they wanted somebody international who gets visual education. Um, and I've worked in three different countries. This will be my fourth museum to direct succeeding somebody who had directed one for a quarter of a century. So my next steps are obviously to continue in engaging with Toledo, um, a progenitor, um, but you know, to really look forward um, to the world. Um, what convinced me was um, the statistic, which is phenomenal and worth knowing if you don't, that the world had a billion people for the first time in 1804 and had two billion people in the 1920s. And in 1975, it had four billion people, 
And by 2025, it will have 8 billion people. We will have added 4 billion people into the world, half of the world's population, in 50, in, uh, 50 years. But where are they? The majority are in Africa. And next, they're in China and in India. And the collections of Peabody Essex are all about that. It's sort of an American V&A, a Victorian Albert Museum, but it has Native American collections, it has fashion collections, it has photography collections, as well as particularly Asian collections and maritime collections. And so it's a, today I see myself a little bit like in the tradition of the sea captains who went around the world uh, around 1800, the museum being founded in 1799, so the oldest continuous museum in America. So this was attractive. Um, and it's an hour away from our daughter and our son-in-law and our grandson, which is attractive. But uh, it was really hard to leave Toledo, so something had to happen that was going on in me saying, maybe it's time for somebody else to do this. But it would, you know, as the board said to me, look, it would have been a lot cheaper if you just asked Anne to come and take a teaching job in Toledo, and we'd even have bought her a house. <laughs> but look, that's not what happened, so that's my next step job. Okay, yeah, rock and roll. Okay, anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna stop you there. So up there we have a little glass of bubbly, or not if you don't want it, um, and uh, just have that and uh, just celebrate yourselves. And particularly you're representative of thousands of people, several hundred thousands of people every year, but you've taken the time to come here this evening and I really do thank you for it. Um, and thank you those who are tremendously involved in the museum, and those who just love to visit it, those who have had long family histories in the museum and those who found it recently. Um, cherish this museum. That's what I have to say to you as I conclude being the ninth director. Nine direct, ninth director since 1901. And uh, it's been the greatest time of my professional life. Uh, and I, I just don't go getting up again. Just go away, okay? Back up to the Libby Court. No more standing ovations. I don't need it. Um, give it to the museum and give it to the musicians every time they perform like you do because my goodness, they're good. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to you all. Let's go up and have a, a glass together in the Libby Court. In okay, go follow the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs>